Hello and welcome. Let's, um, you've all been sitting down for too long. Everybody stand up. Right, what I would like you to do is sit down if you do not own a tablet device or a Kindle or some anything with a seven inch screen. So sit down if you don't. Okay, sit down if you only own the, a Kindle or a Sony ebook reader or some other kind of Nook or some other kind of thing. Uh, sit down if you own only a Google Nexus 7 or other Android tablets, the Galaxy Tab. And I presume everybody else standing up has an iPad. There we go. <laughs> okay. Welcome to Taking the Tablets. This is going to be um, almost a very, quite a personal observation about tablets, um, their use to enhance and enrich teaching and learning, but also where I think we may be going with them. But just a brief introduction. I'm James Clay. I work at Gloucestershire College. We're a large FE college, um, and we have three sites, Forest of Dean, Cheltenham, and Gloucester. Um, and we're at very the early days of using tablets in many respects. But let's just go back and talk about tablets, and maybe let's have a little bit of history. So um, what year was really the tablet invented? Let's have some call-outs. 72, okay, you win the prize. Yeah, 1971. Now, obviously the iPad came out in 2010 and we've seen other things, but of course, if you go back to 1971, we had the Dynabook, probably the first modern tablet, if we exclude chalk and black and slates and those kind of things. And that was some time ago, you know, 42 years ago, we were inventing tablets. But of course, they did evolve, they did change. Basically, screens got smaller, we got styluses, and we started to use in that way, what we called the PDA. And it, if you've been to Alt 10 years ago and eight years ago, you would have seen lots of sessions about PDAs and how they were going to revolutionize teaching and learning and how they were going to replace lectures, how they were going to replace sessions like this. Then, of course, we had things like Newton, which enabled us to write on a screen, which of course was going to replace pen and paper. And even in this room full of learning technologists, there are a few people who are still clinging to the pen and paper. And then maybe we go forward a few more years, the Microsoft tablet, putting the desktop into a pen operating system. Some of you may even had bought these. Some of you may still even be using them. Of course, we had iPad pads in popular culture. Star Trek probably in 1987 started with the next generation. They had the pad. You kind of get an idea that Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive may have been watching it. But of course, it was 2010 when Steve Jobs stood in a theater like this and said, and now for something different, and introduced the iPad. And I would go back and I remember those times and I, th and I thought to myself, to be honest, this is something that I'm only going to use for playing games and watching video. I really couldn't see how it could be used for anything else, especially that was the way it was sold during the Apple keynote. So rather than get the work to buy it, I went out and bought my own. And to me, that was the kind of crunch. You know, I couldn't justify it for work. I couldn't justify the, the, the experiences. I have to admit, I was quite lucky. I won one a month later, so I had two. So I kept one for home and I took one into work, configured it for the wireless, configured it for email, and within about two weeks, I was totally changed my whole opinion of what these devices could do in the workplace. But also then started to think much more about how it could be used for teaching and learning. And of course, in the last two years, we've had kind of other changes. You know, we talk about other tablets. To be honest, Google Nexus 7, if someone said to me, I want to buy a tablet, I've got less than 200 pounds, this may be the device to go for. Then, of course, this week, what happens? Well, last week, Amazon said, oh, Kindle Fire, and we're going to make it available in the UK. And, of course, we've got the iPad Mini, maybe, coming up. So, tablets are changing, the, the way they're evolving, but also, are they that different from where we've been before? To me, the big difference between the iPad and maybe the Dynabook and PDAs 
is that it's gone mainstream. What do I mean by that? It means that your brothers, your sisters, your parents, your uncles, your aunts, your grandmothers, your grandparents are going out and buying iPads and using them. And to me, that's basically, you know, we're talking about Apple will probably announce tomorrow that they've sold 100 million iPads. That's a big data set. That's a lot of people who are using iPads. So where are we as a community? Where are we as learning technologists? Well, if we look at the use of iPads across the UK and in the US as well, a whole spectrum of usage. We have people saying, fine, I've got a small group of learners. We've got 10 iPads. It's great. We've got other places, schools giving an iPad to every single learner. Virtually every educational institution I've been to in the last 12 months has been talking about using, and when I say the word iPad, I am talking about iPads, but we are talking about tablets as well, but have got tablet devices in classrooms, in libraries, in workrooms, and in the hands of learners. So how have they been using the spectrum? Well, the obvious way, and I think the way I saw the iPad very much, was very much as a consumption device. This is something that you can watch movies on. This is something you can read books on. Access magazines. Access content. And it still makes me smile when I'm in a meeting or in a, in a situation and someone says, what does this mean? What's the definition? And I look it up on the iPad and I get accused of cheating. And maybe that's one of the things we need to start thinking about in terms of the usage of iPads as a consumption device or tablets as a consumption device. What they do as with laptops, to be honest, is they reduce the journey time to information. So some of the older people in this room will remember if you wanted to look at old newspapers 40 years ago, you would go to a newspaper archive, and they would only let in postgraduates. They wouldn't let anybody else in because these were delicate things. 20 years ago, if you were an undergraduate, you had access to microfilm. And those of you who remember that, going to swinging through it, trying to find. 10 years ago, we had newspapers on CD-ROM. And now, from the comfort of my own sofa, I can access hundreds of years of digitized newspapers easily and simply. That journey to information has become very short. And I think sometimes we forget when we talk about learning that in the past, often it was that journey to information which was the learning. But now, it shrunk and it shortened. And that creates new challenges for people. It creates new challenges for learners because that journey is so short and so vast that they cannot, access, they cannot deal with just the sheer amount of content and information. Even at a conference like this, I'm here, there are people looking at Twitter, people have got email, they've got their Facebook, they've got other things coming in, they've got other things on their minds. And then therefore, as teachers and lecturers, we have a responsibility to support learners to deal with that flood of information. And to be honest, the tablet can be a tool to do that. One of the main criticisms against the first iPad was it didn't have a camera. It was impossible to do anything with it. It was horrible to type on. But the reality is, that has changed. Anyone who's been watching the Olympics will see hundreds of people going up to people and going, ooh, all this kind of thing, holding things around. Let's take your photograph with a tablet. People are creating movies on there. They're creating audio. They're writing. They're describing. And again, yes, it's maybe not the best tool to touch type on, but maybe we need to rethink the way that we deal with students creating content? Does it always have to be written? Then, of course, you get a lot of criticism, which is like, where do I plug my USB stick into my iPad? And you get people saying, you shouldn't buy an iPad because you can't stick a USB stick into it. As though the USB stick is like this, this god that we need to pray to. Yes, the USB stick, it's incredible. But the reality is, is that we have moved on, but some of us still cling. Who here has got a, put your hand up if you've still got a USB stick. <laughs> More importantly, do you keep, is it just got copies of data on or has it got everything on it in terms of doing it? I work, I've got three libraries. We collect about three or four USB sticks a day in each library as learners who've left them in and so on. Terrible things, really. But the biggest complaint about the iPad is that you can't plug a USB stick into it as though it's a problem. But 
we need to rethink the way our work processes and our workflows and our assignment things that we do to enable people to use these devices, these tablets, without having to worry about legacy devices such as networks and um, USB sticks. And of course, as I said, one of the reasons I bought the iPad, we can talk about it, games and stuff, is interaction. The ability to add an interactivity to a session, the ability to add interactivity to a field work. That's something you wouldn't have been able to do. The problem with the PDA, and anyone who ever had one will realize, was, wasn't the fact it wasn't any good, it was just you didn't have the connectivity to make the most of it. Or you didn't have the battery life. And then, of course, the thing is, we're selling lots of these. Now, we all love our iPads, and we love it so much that now we're doing the research and the analysis that maybe we should have done 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, or even 40 years ago. How many people here are doing a, a pilot or a project with iPads? Please put your hand up. OK. I'd just like you to just stop for a thick second, think, and ask yourself, why? Is it to further you know, knowledge and experience for the human race? Is it because it's something that is really important and no one else has done it before? Or is it mainly because it's like, ooh, shiny? You know, is it because you needed an iPad or you wanted an iPad? Or is it because you're doing a project because the institution doesn't believe in the research that everybody else has done about tablets and mobile devices and says, no, you need to do a project first. You need to do a pilot first before you can do, well, we do what with it? You know, is the end result of your pilot going to be that every learner has a tablet? I would ask, why do you need to do a pilot when those pilots have already been done by loads of other institutions? Why do we not learn from the research of others? Why do we not benefit from the work done by others? Why are th there are so many iPad pilots? Why are yours so different? Have a chance to reflect on that. And that really is, I think, one of the challenges. It's, we, I can talk about tablets, but actually we could talk about any learning technologies. Why is it now that research about iPads is so high on the agenda? And that's a question we need to answer. When the iPad was released, I remember talking to Seb about Alt-C 2010, saying, why isn't there a single session at 2010 on iPads? Part of it is due to that cycle. To be honest, this year, I'm running two this year. I've got this one, and I'm running a session tomorrow. And there's been a lot of discussion on the alt mailing list about iPads as well. So maybe we're coming to that cycle. The problem is, is that that cycle of research and conversations that we've been having is very long and slow. And when you consider in that same time frame, 2010 alt C, not a single mention of iPads at all, to now. Apple have released three versions. They're going to release a fourth version this autumn. They'll release another one next summer. By the time we actually come to conclusions that the iPad may be a useful device, and we've all come to that conclusion for our own independent little pilots and projects with our own little groups of students, actually, to be honest, we would have then moved on. And that's part of the problem. The timing is wrong. We shouldn't be doing the analysis now. We should have been doing it some time ago. And to be honest, what I'd like you to do today or this week is when you go back, don't think about doing another iPad pilot. Think about the technologies that are going to be around in five years or 10 years' time. There's what you should be doing your research on. That's what you should be doing your pilots on. Even technology that may be here in 20 years' time, when it goes mainstream. And in terms of things like tablets, the research has been done. They provide value to learners who like them. Full stop. Job done. This is the time for rollout. And if your institution doesn't want to roll them out, that's their choice. Another kind of bit of a rant on the kind of tablets is, again, I, when you talk to people, people say, to be honest, look, stop talking about the technology and start talking about the pedagogy. Stop talking about the tech and start talking about the practice. And to me, that is OK, but actually ignores some of the affordances that tablets provide teaching and learning. What do I mean by that? Well, 
even on the mailing list in the last couple of weeks, I noticed someone said, said, what you need to do is look at your current practice and see where the iPad or a tablet fits into that practice to make it better or easier. The kind of enhancement model of teaching and learning. And to me, that's, that's fine. But actually, fails to recognize some of the affordances that these sort of devices can bring to teaching and learning. The first of all, I mean, I, to be honest, I do have my other iPad connected to the projector. But to me, this starts to make learning much more mobile. We already discovered this through PDAs and other mobile devices. And immediately, that kind of new way of learning, that new way to access learning, is completely different to the current pedagogical models that we have. And that's why we need to sometimes take a step back and focus on the tech before we focus on the pedagogy. To be honest, we need to do both. So anybody who says, don't talk about technology, talk about pedagogy, is missing the point. Technology changes the way that we do things. It always has. There are new affordances. Let me give you a simple example. The book, OK? When Gutenberg stopped printing Bibles, he realized if he was going to make any more money, he needed to print something else. And he came to the conclusion, as a lot of people did at those times, to start printing plays. Okay? Now, anyone who here has read a play? So, Malcolm, is it the same experience as going to the theater? No. A written play is not the same as a theater experience. But books evolved. Books changed. Printing allowed things called newspapers and magazines. The kind of like evolution of fiction came about, changing from storytelling. So as a result, printed evolved. And it's going to be the same with tablets. They're going to evolve. They're going to change. At the moment, well, maybe they, they have evolved already, but in the past, they've been trying to replicate or duplicate. The reason why Microsoft tablet PC failed was because they had a desktop on a tablet. Apple realized that that didn't work. And as you can see with the iPad and Android tablets, they've changed the way that people interact with them. They're starting to evolve, or they have evolved. But I really want to kind of look at the future. And one of the things that we're going to start to see is that kind of competition and changes. Microsoft Surface. Will it be a revolutionary device that changes everything? I'll leave that one for you to decide. Um, but also the iPad Mini. Cheaper, easier, and will work for some learners. Easier to carry. One of the things I love about the Nexus 7 more than anything else is that it fits in my pocket. Oh, well, maybe on a different jacket. <laughs> but I just want to focus on history. Back in 2007, ASUS, I think that's how you pronounce it, or ASUS, as everybody else does, released the ePC, the netbook. And at that time, the alt mailing list and the conferences were full of people saying, netbooks, they're going to change the world. How many people here are using a netbook? One with a seven-inch screen. No. Oh, one in the back. <laughs> one person in the back. People talked about how netbooks were going to empower learners, were going to revolutionize classroom teaching, it was going to mean the death of the lecture, and a whole range of other things. And here we are, and no one is using netbooks. And I do worry sometimes whether the tablet will go the way of the netbook. Same for ebook readers. To me, this, not the Star Trek, but Look at his desk. How many iPads does he have? If you think about a traditional learner, they have a textbook, they have assignments, journals, handouts, loads of bits of paper. A single tablet is not enough, which is why I have two iPads and a Google Nexus 7. Keep taking the tablets. Thank you very much.